Pants my my ass. I'm on my floor. Bonjour, Monsieur Pussycat. Cracking toast, poet. To start uh, spreading the uh, news. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the short podcast about short films. I am your host, and we are discussing the Academy Award for Best Animated Short. Today's episode is about the 14th year of the award at the 18th Academy Awards, which celebrates the films of 1945. Today's guest is someone you last heard discussing three orphan kittens in the films of 1935. Please welcome the host of the And the Oscar Doesn't Go To podcast, Sam Meltzer. Hello, Sam. Hello, Jackson. I'm so happy to be back. Uh, it is just an honor to have you back again. We loved you the first time. We're glad to have you a second time. This is a great show, and I'll <laughs> continue to be on as long as you'd like me to be. Uh, we'll have. I'm sure we'll have you plenty more times down the road. Uh, but remind us, what is your familiarity with this category? Not that familiar. Again, I'm not too big on the short film categories at the Oscars. I've seen a very small number of the winners and a very small number of the nominees. Usually it's one of the categories at the Oscars each year that I overlook in a way because I have to try and get through all the, the major nominees, the feature length stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's nice that you have a showcase for the category that isn't nearly as t- talked about as you know the major categories or even some of the technical categories. Um, so I, I definitely appreciate that, even though I'm not as into it as you are <laughs> or as all that we talk to are, but it's it's still a fun little thing to to look into. Yeah, that that's what this podcast is all about, to help people who are, aren't as into it, who aren't as familiar, just to try and introduce these shorts to a wider audience. All right. Uh, let it, let's get into the nominees. Uh, this year has seven nominees, and this will be the last year to have more than five. Uh, our first nominee and the year's winner is Quiet Please, directed by William Hanna and Joseph Barbera. Uh, this is the eighth nomination and fourth win for Fred Quimby, and the fifth nomination and third win for Tom and Jerry, currently in a three-year winning streak after last year's Mouse Trouble and 1943's Yankee Doodle Mouse. Uh, this short is also the first and only nomination and win for Spike the Dog, a common companion to Tom and Jerry in these shorts. And this is the only, as this is the only time we'll talk about him, I will read some facts about him from the Tom and Jerry wiki. Uh, he can punch his enemies. He is somewhat easily deceived. He is typically good at fighting, but weak at martial arts. He And he refuses to fight female cats, which is, you know, good to know. Uh, in context of this short, I guess. <laughs> uh, Quiet Please shows Spike getting woken up by Tom chasing Jerry and essentially says to Tom not to wake him up out of threat of violence. So, of course, Jerry does everything he can to wake Spike up while Tom does everything he can to stop him. Uh, Sam, what do you think of our first short? So I watched Tom and Jerry a lot when I was very little. It was definitely something that was on a lot And this is not anything that you wouldn't expect, but it does exactly what it needs to do. It is just a classic Tom and Jerry short. Um, It has that element of um, fighting and absurdity and stylistic decisions that are so old timey and reminiscent of, you know, childhood cartoons in a sense. And it just sums all of that up so wonderfully. And yeah, I mean, again, it, it doesn't do anything amazing but none of these short films really do realistically <laughs> and it it's just a fun entertaining little movie that you know I, I get why it wins it's just something that everybody can be on board with easily and I don't see how you could be passionately against it since it's just so innocent and fun yeah I mean I think it's great I like it yeah this is definitely like it's not a Tom and Jerry short that is like breaking any kind of boundaries or anything. It's a very run of the mill uh, kind of thing. Uh, 
Which, which is kind of why I was like a, a bit less passionate about it than you are. Like, I still enjoyed it. It's still just classic Tom and Jerry, but a lot of it kind of felt just kind of rote. Like, this is like even just comparing to like earlier nominations from it, I feel like all of these jokes have been done in one of the few other shorts that have, that they've already done and even done better in those shorts. It's like. This is not a bad short. This is good. This is this has fun moments, but it just feels a bit uh, like it feels like even only after like five years or something of doing these that they're starting to run out of ways to like keep the formula going, keep the formula fresh, and just like I, I yeah, that that's my overview of being. Uh, I, I get that because I haven't seen, I suppose I'm probably more into it than you are because I haven't watched a Tom and Jerry short in a long time. So maybe if I had seen several others before this, I would have been like, yeah, I'm getting a little tired of this. It's still good, but you know, I'm getting a little sick of it. But maybe because of the fact that I hadn't seen one in so long, it was a nice refresher. But yeah, I, I, the first thing I said was that it doesn't do anything new and you're right. Exactly. Although, um, there, there's a few jokes in here that I think like kind of uh, maybe took me off guard, maybe just like, you know, got a good, really good laugh out of me, especially um, there's the there's a joke when uh, Jerry writes Tom a note. Oh, it's just like, like, I owe you one custard pie. I and Tom's like one custard pie. Let me have it. And Jerry throws it in his face. It's like it's a very it's a stupid joke, but, you know, stupid humor is my kind of humor. <laughs> well, a lot of the jokes in these are pretty stupid. Yeah, yeah. But but... It makes sense. They have to be simple. Exactly. Uh, something I noticed about this is that, like, Tom talks a lot during this. Like, a lot more than he normally would. Like, yes. Like, like these are famously like a silent duo that only really ever talk for like the punctuation of a joke. But like in this, uh, Tom has that line, first of all. Oh, and then also there's like a few minutes when he's singing a lullaby to Spike, like after he's about to wake up, uh, but then, you know, sings him a lullaby to get him to sleep. And it that goes on for a little bit, at least in the context of a short. Uh, so yeah, it was a bit jarring just how much we heard his voice. But yeah, maybe that's why I don't like this as much because he talks so much in it. <laughs> maybe, mm-hmm. maybe. And also one of the other shorts um, we'll get into in a minute, Life with Feathers kind of feels Tom and Jerry-like. Like it's very similar looking. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that later on. But yeah, it it plays in a similar kind of cat and well, not mouse, but cat and victim dynamic. And it's just like it, it, it is going to be interesting to compare them later on. But yeah, th- this is more of a standard farewell that is a bit, you know, out of the ordinary. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and any other thoughts on the short, or would you like to move on? I think that's it. All right. Uh, so our second nominee is Donald's Crime, directed by Jack King. Uh, This is Walt Disney's 21st nomination in this category and the fourth nomination for Donald Duck. Uh, This is also the third and final nomination for Donald's nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, as well as the first and only nomination for Daisy Duck. Uh, Daisy Duck had already been established as Donald's love interest by this point, but the short is notable for the debut of a proper voice actress for her instead of just having Clarence Nash do her voice as well as Donald and the nephews. Uh, She was voiced by Gloria Blondell, younger sister of Joan Blondell, which is, you know, fun fact. Uh, Also, Donald's inner voice in this short is voiced by Sterling Holloway, better known as the voice of Winnie the Pooh, as well as the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. Uh, anyway, uh, Donald's crime starts with Donald having a date with Daisy, but he needs some money. Uh, he sees his nephew's piggy bank and decides to take the money from it. He sends them off to bed, takes the money, and then goes on his date. But afterwards, the guilt begins to feed on him as he imagines himself as a criminal. Uh, now, I really like this short. I... I'm a big Donald fan and like a short like this really shows like 
why Donald is such a unique character from Mickey and Goofy, because you couldn't really believably do this as like, say, Mickey short. Mickey is too squeaky clean and stuff to, you know, stealing from a children's piggy bank is not like the biggest offense. That's part of the joke of it. But it's still like Disney wouldn't want Mickey to be doing this. They wouldn't want you to think that Mickey was capable of doing this. Yes. But meanwhile, uh, Donald is more human. He like you understand that like he he really wants to go on this date with Daisy, but he doesn't have any money. Meanwhile, there's just this money right here that he can use and no one will notice. It's like he so it's a much more like kind kind of human kind of emotion. And I think this really plays well. Uh, it's just like you see like like you see the nervousness as Donald like almost gets caught by his nephews early on, but like you know, he he acts out kind of uh harshly towards them just because he know he wants to get him out of the way and get them to bed and, and then it's just like then he's having fun with daisy and it's always nice to see donald having fun at, at least for a moment before you know we see his downfall later on but yeah he and daisy have a grand old time i'm and then the like the later part of the short when uh the so donald has this inner voice throughout this whole thing it may it's going for a kind of noir parody where it's just like as the constant narration and stuff of of the like the main character's thoughts and uh the way the scene like slowly kind of transforms from just like you know donald duck walking home to like donald duck in the middle of a noir movie and like every everybody's out to get him and he's like like a hardened criminal and like wanted posters from everywhere i really like that kind of gradual transformation of it and it just it's a really good atmosphere too i just really enjoyed this short kind of all around just very very solid donald short what do you think i agree with you you point out this sort of noir imitation in a way and i think it does a good job at making it cute and interesting especially if children are an attraction for this and I like the plotting of it all I think it moves at a good pace I sort of like the real world drama as opposed to a lot of these other short films they feel very head in the clouds and while this obviously has slapsticky elements and such it definitely has a better grasp of reality which I get isn't what people want to watch as much when they're watching an animated cartoon short film but I don't know, it's, it's something else. One thing though, I don't love the way Donald Duck sounds. I'm sorry, it's kind of irritating, uh, especially when he talks this much and just like the voice of all the ducks is kind of a lot. That was my only thing. Yeah. I... Much talking, I get that it's more based on the plot with this one, but I don't know. I guess it kind of, I kind of got on my nerves that a few moments. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I definitely get it. I Donald's voice can be like hard to understand, a bit grating, and, and it's always a bit jarring how like, uh, Clarence Nash voices both Donald and the nephews, and he voices the nephews with one singular voice. It's not like three different voices is that are playing at the same time or anything. It's just like the three of them talk as one, like they're a hive mind, and it's 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 weird. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's and they so talk exactly like that. It's yeah, and um, an earlier short, I think it's called Mr. Duck Steps Out. It's the first short with Daisy in it. And so, and like I mentioned, Clarence Nash also voices Daisy in that short using the same exact voice. And so, you got these three are really five different characters, all with one guy using the same <laughs> voice for all of them. <laughs> And that's like one of my favorite Donald shorts, but even then it's like it's jarring and <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's I definitely get it. It's yeah, and the voice could be rough. I imagine it's rough on him to do it all as much oh, as he yeah, did it. it probably hurts your throat in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have much to add. You kind of said everything there is to say about it. And also the ending is kind of like clever. Like with him sort of rubbing his face weirdly and going blah, 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 or whatever. Like that was kind of funny. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I love when characters kind of do that. Uh, there's a, yeah. I think it's in uh, A Quiet Place uh, where there's also like a Spike the Dog. He does something similar where it's just like he's telling Tom about like how much sleep he needs. It's like it, he's driving me crazy and like he's pulling on his ears and stuff. It's it, it's kind of funny when char- cartoon characters do that. Yeah, Which, yeah. It is. it's very like expressive mm-hmm. and showy in a fun way but yeah uh donald's crime really fun donald short uh on to our third nominee which is jasper and the beanstalk directed by george powell uh this is powell's fifth nomination and the first and only nomination for jasper one of powell's recurring characters uh now i've gone on and on about how much i hate george powell and perhaps some of you who are watching along might feel i've been too hard on him and his puppet tunes however i think all of us can agree that this aspect of george powell's career is one worth hating uh, you see Jasper is a little black boy, and yes, all of George Powell's Jasper shorts play fully into awful stereotyping of black characters that was so intensely prevalent at this time, as we've discussed many times on this podcast before. Uh, Jasper's design is exactly what you'd expect from this time, evoking images of minstrelsy, and is often portrayed as dim-witted and very gullible. And in Jasper and the Beanstalk, which is, of course, a retelling of the fairy tale Jack and the Beanstalk, he trades his, he trades his mouth harp to the Scarecrow, who is a common antagonist in these shorts, for a few black magic beans, uh, clearly intended to be a trick on poor Jasper. But lo and behold, a beanstalk grows straight into the sky, taking Jasper with it, and he finds a magic harp voiced by Peggy Lee, as well as a giant that strongly resembles the Scarecrow. Uh, Sam... What did you think of this short? So I couldn't find the full version of it, but I also didn't really care to watch the whole thing. (laughs) I knew the story and I saw the majority of it. I will say this though. I do like the stop motion aspect. Mm -hmm. Like it looks different than all of the other nominated uh, shorts that I've watched here. And that is definitely unique. But also, like, I don't know, as you said, it's definitely pivoting into all of these African-American stereotypes of the time. And it doesn't age particularly well. And it's not particularly cute or funny. So, unfortunately, I wasn't kind of interested. Yeah, it, it, like, I, I'm not one to shy away from hating on George Powell, but it's just like, this is not anything worth really remembering from him. It's just like, first of all, if you just like focus on it as a Jack and the Beanstalk adaptation, it's just a Jack and the Beanstalk adaptation. It doesn't do anything particularly uh, notable or anything. And, and then of course, it's just uh, this whole world of, racial stereotyping that we were dropped into it's like everything Mm -hmm. about it just every aspect of it in one way or another is like evoking all these racist imagery uh if if i wanted to be positive about the short i could say that uh i liked peggy lee as the harp she most of her role is just singing and peggy lee is a very good singer so that part was nice i guess Uh, (laughs) And yeah, it's just like one one of my few compliments for George Powell is, is you just throughout is that I am a fan of stop motion animation. His animation is good usually, and so it's just like, and and like you said, the the fact that this is a stop motion short in a field, a, a whole decade of everything else being two D animation, it makes him and his short stand out, uh, and so. Give him credit for that. Give him and, but outside of that, it's just a mediocre racist short that, frankly, I don't want to spend too much more time talking about because you know it sucks. It does kind of suck, and it's also nothing to talk about. It's just a classic fairy tale story. Exactly. With a little bit of racism mixed in there. Mm-hmm. 
All right. So our mm-hmm. fourth nominee uh, is Life with Feathers, directed by Frizz Freilang. Uh, this is the first nomination for Edward Selzer, the new producer over at Warner Brothers for the Mary <laughs> Melodies franchise, which is on its ninth total nomination. Uh, this is the debut short for Sylvester the Cat, who will eventually become the most nominated Looney Tunes character with eight career nominations, as well as three wins, the most for a single character behind only Tom and Jerry. So, how are we introduced to this icon of animation? Well, Life with Feathers is about a lovebird who, after his wife throws him out of the birdcage, tries to kill himself and decides the best way to do that is to get a cat to eat him. However, Sylvester, seeing the bird's desire to be eaten, thinks he's poisoned and refuses to. Uh, some very dark comedy ensues. Uh, and as we kind of alluded to, this is a play on the standard uh cat and victim dynamic uh uh, but it does put it on its head a little bit because instead of a cat just wanting to eat eat the bird the bird is the one that wants to be eaten and the cat is doing everything to prevent that because you know he thinks it's poisoned and it's just like and just the addition that it's like like it's very clear that this bird is very suicidal and it's just like he thinks of other ways to die by a, like gunshot or laying on the train tracks or whatever and decides the cat's the best way to do it and it's just like it's very dark but that's what makes this short so great i really love this i thought it was really hilarious very 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 fun looney tune it has the same kind of looney tune humor you expect but it's just I just had a lot of fun with it. And Sylvester, this is his first short, but already one, he's fully formed as a character, and two, he is killing it. I pun intended, kind of, even since he's not really killing it, killing anything in this, but <laughs> he is killing it with his performance. And just like I, I love his character, especially in this short. He is just an absolute delight. And I'm surprised the lovebird never came back. Like I would have thought that like he would he could have been like a kind of recurring character, but you know he he wasn't. I think this is the only time he appears or anything like him appears. I guess maybe Tweety Bird uh, stole all p- potential for him. Who knows? <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, it. I like this really great short. Sam, how about you? <laughs> Yeah, I really like this one. Um, as you said, just immediately dark, but in a way that's kind of funny and like gripping. You're just so hooked already from the fact that there's a suicidal love bird. Like, wow. And of course, like the animated voices are very familiar. And then you get into this whole gag. It's like, of course, the cat won't eat the bird because he's suicidal and won't let him die. And like there's just so many fun gags in this one like the fact that the bird wrote a letter and two seconds later got a package to with 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 like what was it a hammer so that he could hit the bird to try so that the bird could hit the cat (laughs) try and get the cat angry so that the cat would eat the bird and that all happened within like the same 10 seconds i mean this is incredible and also like when he hit the cat you get that yo sound (laughs) that's like so much fun and then it's like he tries to lock the bird out of the house and he closes those windows so unbelievably quickly like he's running around that house closing each window on each side within three seconds I mean that's so impressive I don't know it, it's just like this literal cat and as you said victim game and it's so unconventional but it's so clever I re- I really like this one this is so much fun yeah, with that uh, window closing guy, I really like how after it, it it shows him like completely out of breath too. Like he, he like he he put everything into just keeping those windows closed, keeping the bird out. Uh, I think my favorite like attempt to get the cat to eat him is like near the end when he's the bird has the radio going on this like cooking program, and he also has a cookbook with you know, pictures in it. He's just showing the cat. Uh, showing Sylvester all the pictures and making him trying to make him as hungry as he can, and and it was making me hungry too. Like I, if Sylvester wasn't going to eat this bird. I would have, of like I was hungry after this, <laughs> and I 
and after I watched it, I, or after we finished the shorts, I I went and got some lasagna for myself because I had some. So, yeah, it, it made me really hungry. Um, <laughs> which might be a bit messed up considering it's short but you know i think it was that was what it was going for anyway so (laughs) So, sell some snacks at the movie theater you know also when he gets back to the cage it's the housewife right who's there yeah it's a housewife sounds like betty davis i i do not remember her voice so i'm gonna take your word on that (laughs) i that was the first thing i thought of and then it ended with him like kicking him out and him running away again, suicidal. Um, but I don't know, it really reminded me of like older Betty Davis. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so, something I was thinking about was like, wh- what did this lovebird do to make his wife hate him so much? Like, was he just, you know, a man in the 40s or did he actually like do something? <laughs> because it's like, she she is pissed at him. And like, like I'm just wondering like, what did he do? Like, why? Why? How did we get here? Yeah, I mean, we'll never know. We'll, we'll never know. All a gag. Uh, may, yeah, who knows? Maybe, maybe he said something about his about his mother-in-law or something. And because it's uh, at the end of it, it's like he gets a telegram that like the wife is going to uh, the in-laws' place, and it's like he's happy about it but he says that in front of his wife who actually decided not to go and so he gets kicked out again and is looking for the cat as we you know uh, do the pinpoint ender short uh so yeah hmm. who knows what how this man is screwing up his marriage i i, I do assume <laughs> it's his fault <laughs> All right, that's a good place to move on. So our fifth nominee is Mighty Mouse, directed by Connie Rosinski. Uh, this is the third and final nomination for Paul Terry, though his Terry Tune studio would go on to get one more nomination after he sold the studio to CBS in 1955. Uh, this is also the first and only nomination for the Mighty Mouse character. Uh, while Mighty Mouse is mostly known for later Saturday, Saturday morning cartoon shows, he did originate as a theatrical short character. And before I get into the, his nominated short, I should point out that Mighty Mouse is not actually the title of this short. I refuse to say the actual title because it, it contains a slur for the Roma people. Anyway... The film is an operatic short about a group of Roma mice traveling and a group of bats that really just look like cats with wings attack them. Uh, Hope seems lost until Mighty Mouse comes to save the day. Sam, what did you think of this short? It was okay. Um, It's kind of like this parade of the animals singing and you see their inner lives and their affairs and such. It didn't really do anything for me. I sort of like the cats and like the villain song that they have. Um, and I like the my the best thing about it I can say is like the contrast of the atmospheres between like the lair where the cats live and then like the home where all the parade animals live. I thought that was well done. Um, but for the most part, I wasn't particularly interested. Unfortunately, I just thought it was kind of boring. Um, I don't know. And yeah. I don't really understand the title. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a very it's. It's kind of a unique short because one it's like i said it's an operatic short and and i'm a sucker for opera so i really like the music and stuff i i thought it was uh i enjoyed this as like a musical experience however uh one uh it was just kind of it was kind of boring a bit like uh it just went on for a bit too long in every section and I don't really know why that is. It just, you know, not a very well crafted short. And also, it's like the Mighty Mouse antics is not really all that engaging. And then it's just like the stuff that introduces us to the 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 mice and then the bats and stuff. It's just like it all goes on. It's all weirdly paced, and I'm not don't really like that. And also, the animation is just awful like it uh, is it's so weird and the teeth of the animals look so wrong yeah it's it's so strange and this is because of paul terry and the terry tunes studio uh i mentioned before in this podcast but for you sam and for those who are listening for the first time uh 
Paul Terry and the Terry Tunes, they pride themselves on the fact that they are cheap. Uh, like Paul mm-hmm. Terry would brag about how he get like shorts out so quickly. Uh, and it shows that he gets shorts out very quickly because very few of them are all that polished or look good or <laughs> very few are worth watching. And the fact that Paul at the, the Terry Tunes that the most popular character is Mighty Mouse, who is only popular because of a TV show that aired in the a Saturday morning cartoon show in the 60s, not because of any of these shorts have having lasted uh, culturally at all. It's just like, this is not a man who was in it for like the art or anything. He is just trying to make a quick buck. And you know i i almost respect it how just unabashedly he was about this he didn't try to hide it or anything but no, and yeah. it's also not hiding the fact that it's like a blatant disney copy oh yeah this is just you know this is this has sequences that are just like reminiscent of like like fantasia Every things or something like that it's Every just, one. yeah it's just like I think a little, I've I've also mentioned on this podcast before how I'm a sucker for a move for a short with the good music. So I think I like this a bit more than I should because I just enjoy the music really well uh, or a lot. Uh, but this is just a very mediocre short. This is not worth remembering. This isn't worth the nomination it got. It's just this this short has been lost to time and it it was lost for a good reason. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. I didn't really like the first opening song. I liked the others though. I I liked the first song. I like the like I the stuff where it's just the mice by themselves. I with and then the cat and their villain song. I I think I liked the short more before Mighty Mouse came in. <laughs> it's just like this was good before it became a Mighty Mouse short. Because I feel like he didn't really add much to it. Like I, I feel like yeah. they the mice could have handled themselves like they could have found a way to get rid of the bats on their own i don't know yeah like there's i believe in them they're strong they're capable they're they're feisty they can do it Mm -hmm. all right that's a good place to end uh uh, let's move on to our sixth nominee, which is The Poet and Peasant, directed by Dick Lundy. Uh, this is the seventh nomination for Walter Lance and the second nomination for Andy Panda. Uh, this short was a sort of proof of concept by Dick Lundy about making a short based around music, which is, you know, revolutionary. Uh, <laughs> there, we haven't seen that before. Uh, and this short was a minor success and would lead to creation of the musical miniature series from Walter Lance Productions, the first of which musical moments from Chopin uh, would be nominated the following year. Uh, as for the poet and, pa- the poet and peasant, uh, it features Andy Panda conducting an orchestra of other animals with attempts at comedy happening in sync to the music. Uh, this is a not at all a good short this is kind of grading the sit through because it, it clearly is trying to rip off better short films ones that are funny uh and like this kind of concept where you gotta can you got this real music composed a long time ago oh being used in the animation medium to put jokes over it so that like the music is in time the jokes the jokes are in time the music it, the comedy music accentuate each other but it's just done much better pretty much everywhere else it's been done uh mm-hmm. this short like one the music itself i i don't think this composition is all that good like it, it's fine the music is fine but then it's just like and then you pair it with these jokes which are barely jokes and are not executed well at all well it's just a bunch of so most uh animated shorts they just kind of throw everything at the wall and sees what sticks this short throws everything at the wall and nothing sticks that's the best way to put this it's just it tries a comedy and fails on every front and you're just left with this uh, very annoying and also poorly animated experience that you know i wish i could forget sooner 
yeah, this is really, really, really horrible. Um, like actually so bad, so boring. It has no plot at all. The the only thing I liked was when the guy crushed the other one with the symbols and it, his head was in one piece. <laughs> Um, and some of the side animals are cute, but yeah, like Asian stereotypes, very racist, not funny, barely a story. It's just a bunch of weird gags to a song. It goes on for what feels like eight years. <laughs> and it's, I don't know, it's ugly. Like the color palette is like kind of ugly and the music isn't interesting and I just kept wanting it to be over. I feel like even if I watched it at like 1.5 speed, it still would have been boring. Um, yeah, no, this is just horrible. It don't understand how it was able to get nominated for anything. How can you watch this and say that this is worthy of receiving a top honor in the film? It's just ridiculous. It's so bad. Yeah, it. I don't understand. I think it's just because, like, at this time, they they tried to spread the wealth of nominations because, like, early days, Walt Disney kind of ran everything. So it's just like, you know, let's mm -hmm. make sure every studio can get a nomination if they want one. And so you are stuck with these Terry Tune and uh, uh, Walter Lance nominations that are just not worth anything. But, yeah. you know, they still get nominated for whatever reason, just because they, the Academy is being nice to get give them a seat at the table. And and thank God we go to a standard uh, five and under lineup after this, because, dear God, I these last few years where it's just a just and anything can be nominated. It just like goes up to 10 in, in one year. It's just like. And that just allows in just the most mediocre, forgettable shorts to get in here. And it's like, I do this show because I enjoy animation. I want to celebrate animation. But there, there's there been so much that I can't celebrate There's with just nothing positive to say about it. It's just... Yeah, nothing. Uh, and nobody cares about it anymore. So it got what it deserves. Yeah, exactly. Nobody knows who Andy Panda is, but really, it's like Woody, even Woody Woodpecker, who was the star of Walter Land's productions, people barely remember him anyway. Like, I know he's very popular in like Brazil, but in terms of like the world as a whole, people don't really care about Woody Woodpecker anymore. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's we we can move on i i want to stop talking about this stupid short uh yeah. and so our seventh and final nominee is rippling romance directed by bob wickersham uh like last year this nominee is listed in most places as screen gems so it's hard to name a specific person as the nominee for this short but i determined that the award would have gone to paul worth making this his first and only nomination worth was many mainly a composer for the different shorts at columbia pictures and even wrote the music for the previous for a previous nominee imagination uh, but he was briefly the lead producer as well and ended up in an, and ended up producing this nominee. Uh, worth worth noting is that uh, this is the last nominee we'll see produced by Scream Gems uh, after five nominations. Uh, the studio was Columbia's in-house animation studio, first prevailing under the leadership of Charles Mintz, but after his departure went through a series of producers who had little care for the studio and its product. Uh, at times, this gave the animators much freedom, and there was some experimentation going on, but it also led to a lot of shorts that merely copied what was popular at the time, like previous nominee Dog, Cat, and Canary being just a Tom and Jerry ripoff. Uh, Scream Gems de declined in popularity further and further, and eventually would be shut down in 1946. After this point, Columbia would instead license outside studios for animation, and we'll discuss that more at their next nomination. Uh, but now this is the part where I would tell you the plot of Rippling Romance or perhaps interesting details about the short itself. And after that, Sam and I would go on into our thoughts about the short. But unfortunately, we can't do that. Uh, I have told you all the information I have on the short. Its title, the person who directed it, the producer, the fact it's Columbia. That's it. Uh, there is 
I don't have a plot description. There is no copy of it available online. And many people believed this film to be lost. However, there are uh, a couple surviving copies of it at the British Film Institute. So we can only speculate as to what this film might be. This is this is the only uh, film that we won't be able to watch over the course of this podcast. So, Sam, anything you'd like to say about this film that you haven't seen and know nothing about? Oh, yeah. I have so much to say. I mean, I could just go on for hours because I'm, I'm just that knowledgeable on it. What What do you think this would be about? Like, just considering the title Rippling Romance, what, what do you imagine? I have such a clear vision of the plot. I mean, Rippling Romance. <laughs> That the, there was a romance and it was certainly Maybe, rippling. It was probably rippling. <laughs> I, what what would like what would rippling mean in terms of a romance? Like, does that is that something kind of like an up and down romance? Like, you know, how like the, the yeah, when like waves ripple. ripple. Like there's an the ripple effect, you know? Yeah. It it's it it's truly an enigma of titling and maybe this title is just so uh so perfect for what the short actually is May- maybe it just encapsulates so many nuances of what this short could be yeah right. it's like right and like going through the definitions of ripple it's, it's like it forming or flowing with a series of small waves in the surface moving in a way that resembles a series of small waves uh form or flow with a series of small waves on the surface it's just like there's so many ways that ripple could be interpreted (laughs) small waves right and also like the the rippling yeah like waves maybe it's a beach romance maybe they're a resort in hawaii maybe oh there'd be ample time for more racism then oh of course (laughs) Uh, they, they gotta they gotta be racist it's the only way you can be funny apparently. the only way you can be good and get nominated mm-hmm. obviously yeah the rippling romance isn't that every romance isn't doesn't every romance ripple in one way or another if you I think about so. it <laughs> <I guess. laughs> uh, wow we we had more fun talking about a short that we we don't even then, know anything then about. Then probably half of these, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, but yeah, but that romance sure was rippling. Anyway, uh, now that we've gone through and talked about the seven nominees, let's rank them all. Well, well of course, not all of them, but the six that are available. Uh, Sam, start us off with your number six. The poet and peasant. Yeah, same. That is also poem peasant is my six as well. <laughs> Just an utter waste of animation resources. Uh, yeah. Number five, Jasper and the Beanstalk. Same. It's just like, well, while this short is racist, at least it has some semblance of you know a story and entertainment. And Peggy Lee is there. She sings nice. Uh, number four. Mighty Mouse. Uh, I have Quiet Please. And what's your number three? Donald's Crime. I have Mighty Mouse, which is which we talked about is just kind of a generic, uh, un uninteresting, ugly short. Though mm-hmm. I enjoyed the music. Uh, what's your number two? My number two is the winner. Quiet Please. Uh, I, any concluding thoughts on quiet please <laughs> if you'd like to share um it's fun <laughs> okay uh <laughs> my my number two is donald's cry which is which as i said just a very very gr- solid donald short a lot of fun Ooh, the noir parody is great and your number one which is also we my have number the one. same number one we Life agree feathers. we like suicidal bird her betty Dave is betty davis wife and uh the cat sylvester sylvester (laughs) yes we in this house we love suicide that is funny to us oh yes (laughs) sure uh but yeah there's a great looney tune check it out or i guess merry melody in this case i it 
I didn't realize they were like bef- before really getting into this. I didn't realize that Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies were not like two names for the same series, but two concurrent series that are running side by side. And like some shorts are Looney Tunes, some shorts are Merry Melodies. And like every nominee from Warner Brothers up, up to this point has been a, a Merry Melody. And I think the only I think there might only be one or two that are technically Looney Tunes. I think uh, the Pepe Le Pew short that gets nominated was a Looney Tune. I think maybe the Bugs Bunny short that's later on, but I'm not sure about that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a fact, fun fact for you all, in case you didn't know, like I did. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, Life of Feathers, great short, very fun. I'm glad we have the same number one and number six. Uh, And number five. And number five. Uh, yeah it it's interesting like how like for most of this podcast we've had i i've pretty much agreed with my guests as on the shorts and are and even when we don't like precisely agree we usually do have the same winners uh but there's been a couple times when it's just like we've had like like i've been just like completely opposite of my guests <laughs> it's it, it's interesting trying to trying to chart that has like I, sometimes I wonder if it's just like m- like me I my guests are like outliers while everyone else is against us or is like or or when we disagree it, it's like like one of us is just completely in the wrong <laughs> <laughs> who, who knows we've we we've had very similar thoughts yeah across all the shorts we've talked about over our two episodes yeah say. we you you and i are in sync it, at least in, when it comes to the uh what it said the nine shorts we talked about yeah yeah uh but anyway before we end our show are there any final thoughts you'd like to share sam or anything you'd like to promote watch life with feathers and don't watch the poet and Peasant. <laughs> all right uh, I, I can get behind that Uh, Well, thank you, Sam, for coming on the show. And thank you, listener, for tuning in. Uh, This has been the short podcast about short films. Until next time, goodbye.